Welcome to Scandal Water, where the tea is hot and the conversation lively. Your hosts, Candy and Ashley, will discuss a peculiar story somehow related to the entertainment industry. This podcast might not change the world, but it just might satisfy your thirst for an intriguing tale. Oh, it's that time of day. Tune in and hear what the ladies say. It's time to bend your ear when the silver screen appears. Stories about the stage and screen and everything in between. So come on and join the fun. The curtain opens in three, two, one. Hello, Ashley. Hello, Candy. I have an interesting little question for you today. All right, let me have it. Start, which it's nostalgic. Mm. I think you're gonna like it. Okay. Okay. Our episode today, we won't we won't tell our listeners yet. We'll hang on for just a second. Okay. But. This was the lead Mm -hmm. from a Time Magazine article that I ran across when researching our topic. Mm -hmm. I thought this was beautifully expressed. It says, when you're a child, you have no idea what you'll remember forever. Mm -hmm. Your elders may try to create memories in advance for you by staging elaborate birthday parties or planning faux rustic camping trips. But the things we remember best from childhood, flopping down in a nighttime backyard and trying to make sense of the majesty of stars, watching a caterpillar pillars fuzzy back ripple at the touch of a finger bike riding around and around the neighborhood in nowheresville circles seldom emerge from planned events our future memories have a knack of evading the management of adults no matter how well-meaning those adults may be Hmm. so i thought i would ask you and we don't i mean we don't have to share long stories Mm -hmm. but just little vignettes or little snapshots what are a few of those childhood memories for you that are very special so one of the things that I do remember doing is when I was probably in my teen years, mm-hmm. I was getting into film, mm. of course, because I've been watching films my whole life. And I would make my brother and my sister make little movies and <laughs> videos with me. And I would do that with my cousin, too. We would just uh. stay up really late and we would make all these um, cinematic masterpieces, of course, starring us. And, and then we would <laughs> we would take songs and we would make music videos to the actual songs. Nice. So so we would do that and then I remember playing in the backyard and or playing on top of farm wagons where I would pretend that was a stage and I was you know I, I I was destined for the stage in some some form or Clearly. fashion. Yeah. <laughs> and just playing and just like you said, like your paragraph just said, it was the everyday memories, mm-hmm. just being in your family, watching television together. Mm-hmm. My mom would play the soundtrack to Oklahoma. She would play a lot of the Broadway musical things for us. And she really, she's the one that kind of fostered my love of classic cinema. Kind of, <laughs> some of it was through a, um, not stipulation, but like a curfew because after nine o'clock, I was not allowed to watch anything except oh. for Nick at Night or the American Movie Classics channel because she had a theory that all the bad stuff happened after <laughs> nine o'clock on television. So that's that's I really have her to thank for my love of classic cinema. Wow. Well yeah. how cool is that? Yeah. I tried to think of a few of mine as well. A couple that come to mind. I remember playing Monster in the Well or mm. Hide and Seek in the Dark with cousins or neighborhood friends. With my cousins again I remember catching lightning bugs. Mm. That was fun. In my neighborhood we had a little creek that was down kind of we had I would lived in a subdivision for a while mm-hmm. and we were it was kind of down there at the end of the road and mm-hmm. we would sometimes go and play in the creek and mm-hmm. you know just do you have any smells from your childhood there's a certain kind of grass that when we lived we lived for a very brief time about six years in Louisville the rest of the time I've lived in the country mm-hmm. and when at this house which was th- most of my growing up you know seminal age six to twelve I was mm-hmm. in this house in Louisville and there was a patch of clover that had a definite scent to it and anytime I am around or if I'm out in a field at my grandparents' place, I was walking through somewhere and I went, oh, this smells like home. Mm-hmm. And it was just that brief, you got taken right back to that time. 100%. Uh-huh. I have some smells that, that have associations for me. Honeysuckle makes me think of my papa's house mm-hmm. and right along like the fence line of his home. I also have some sensory, like touch. Oh, for example, okay. one of my childhood memories was I lived in a subdivision until I was about, I guess, eight or nine. And 
and then we moved to the country. Okay. We had 10 acres of land in Indiana. But when I was in the subdivision, I can remember laying on the black asphalt, which mm. was really hot and warm. It was mm-hmm. summer and it started to rain. Oh. And that cool rain mm-hmm. and then the steam. The warm steam. And yes. Nice. And like that memory is so vivid for me. That's and, you lovely. Know, and I also think about, it's kind of a touchy and a visual thing, um, holding my grandpa's hand whenever we would visit him and my grandma. She was not as active as he was so we would we would hang out with grandma and do certain Mm -hmm. things but then papa would take us and he would hold our hands and he would walk us to a convenience store and he would Mm. buy us a piece of candy oh that's nice i like that you call him papa yeah papa so i thought we would start with that Mm -hmm. because we are getting ready to talk about one of the most beloved movies of all time and this was the lead to an article talking about it because childhood and a child's perspective Mm -hmm. is at the core of this yes the film of course is et yes ashley and i were following that thread we were and we actually gave you a clue in the last episode there was a sentence that was a little bit of a clue if you heard it which was do you remember what you said no you said oh harrison ford married melissa matheson Mm -hmm. who went on to write the screenplay for et you just kind of planted that little clue there (laughs) i didn't want to give it away but yes we're going to come back to melissa because she is obviously very important in this but this article is actually called et still perfectly captures the longing of childhood for years later Mm. and it goes on to make the case that this is their quote et the extraterrestrial is the spirit of those iridescent memories captured like an immortal lightning bug in movie form it's one of the finest fantasy films ever made and the most tender of all steven spielberg's movies showing a purity of emotion and intent that's distinctive even among all the films he's made in his long and fruitful career. Wow. And then your little segue heads right into this because it goes on to say screenwriter Melissa Matheson deserves a lot of credit Mm. for that. They called it fine grained swirl of joy and wistfulness. Wow. Yeah. So a beautiful film and Melissa Matheson is responsible for a huge part of that. Right. And in case you missed my sort of vagueness. So the thread is we went from Star Wars to Harrison Ford. And now we were going from Harrison Ford to Harrison Ford's wife, Melissa, who wrote Mm E.T. So there you go. There's the thread. Yeah. And we're going to talk about specifically how she came to become the screenwriter for this film. But first, I just wanted to ask you Mm -hmm. so far, Mm -hmm. we've we've just kind of introed it talking about the the beauty and the tenderness mm-hmm. and, and the wistfulness. You just rewatched it, as did I. I. Did. Do you agree so far? <laughs> so tough to say because okay so I rewatched it and I was positive I had seen it I'm not positive I ever saw oh, this oh really I am not because as we've alluded to in previous <laughs> previous episodes I have a real hard time with aliens and they <laughs> Me a little she bit. sent me a picture of her watching the movie, <laughs> oh and she looks like she's being traumatized. I, like she looks like she's being well, tortured. To, to be fair, I was watching it, and it's when it's when ET is first startled, and he made a movement, and then I paused it at that. I was like, ah, and I had to show Candy what I was looking at. You can see his little teeth, and he looks so scary. And then I, I told her I'm compiling a list of things that make me deeply uncomfortable. Number one is spindly fingers and spindly limbs and the number two is tiny teeth (laughs) (laughs) but oh my eyes are watering but past that yes i can Mm -hmm. see the nostalgia i can see the i can see everything Mm -hmm. if i can get past my like it's your own personal aversion it's my own personal aversion to those things that made me so uncomfortable but henry thomas i could still see it henry thomas absolutely sold this film and little drew barrymore she was amazing wasn't she she? was precious yes absolutely i love adorable in fact in i'm going to come back to this many times probably but drew barrymore recently on her talk show for Mm -hmm. the 40th anniversary she had a reunion and brought her little family back together and henry thomas the fella who plays elliot he straight up said you stole the show she and was so every time cute. you were in a scene you she stole was it so cute yeah 
She was. So I'm going to say that I absolutely respect everybody who has deep nostalgia Mm -hmm. related to this. I think if I didn't see it as a kid, if I'm just seeing it as an adult, I don't have the nostalgia because I don't remember seeing it as a kid. Mm -hmm. However, I will compare it to after we watched E.T., Brian and I have been working on a long-term project together in in the house. And so we've been playing movies in the background. We have this little game where he will start a film and, you you know, my trivia brain, he will see how long it takes me to guess what the film is Mm -hmm. based on on the audio and he, he stood in front of the television he said don't look up he started it and he started counting off i guess the film within the first like second and a half wow it was the sound of a clang of a jail and i went the goonies and he said yep so for me the goonies is my et mm-hmm. so there you go i can i can take everything i feel about the goonies and i can apply it toward how people feel about et mm-hmm. so i was glad that i was actually glad he picked that because i thought oh now i understand Mm-hmm. You know, for mm-hmm. for them, for, for me, The Goonies is my E.T. Which is interesting. I'm glad you said that because I think you bring up the fact that this is, this is double layered. Like there is the nostalgia factor. Uh-huh. I'm actually talking, I think, more so a different aspect, which is whether or not you've seen the movie. I think it was a huge goal to show this from the perspective of a child. Yeah. Like as I was taking notes on the film, I literally wrote the word wonder in mm-hmm. huge capital mm-hmm. letters because so much of it was focused on this feeling of magic and mm-hmm. wonder and the fantasy and the, and just that purity of child emotion, right, you right. know, his longing and, and all the things. It just, I felt childlike wonder mm. coming from the characters, coming from the script itself. Had you seen this as a kid? I saw it at some point. I I don't remember when. Um, yes, I was young when I saw mm-hmm. it, and I and I thought I had seen it since. But as I did the rewatch, I was like, I don't think I have. I okay. don't think I have seen this thing in forever me because too. it if was I almost did, like I was seeing it for the first time. Me too. Yep. Yeah, which made me appreciate it on a different level. Mm-hmm. Here is a summary from a, a Smithsonian article. I'm actually going to ask Ashley to read this. Sure. The movie follows ten-year-old Elliot, played by Henry Thomas, as he meets and befriends an alien who got left behind on Earth. When Elliot first encounters the orphaned extraterrestrial, he's understandably terrified. But over time, the two become chummy, with Elliot eventually uttering the memorable line, I'm keeping him. Despite their connection, Elliot must find a way to get E.T. back home. Shot from the perspective of a child, the movie delicately addresses complex topics like divorce, loneliness, and sibling dynamics. As film critic Sean Burns writes for WBUR, E.T. remains one of the purest and most emotionally direct of all American movies, with not a whit of adult condescension nor any self-protecting irony. And I loved that when I first read it. But then as I continue to research and also watch the movie, I started to be even more impressed by that last part when they named that it really hits on the ideas of loneliness, divorce, and sibling dynamics. Because I was like, this is so insightful. It really does. It really does. When you when you just step back, I would have said, oh, it's a movie about an alien or Mm -hmm. it's it's a movie about a relationship between a child and an alien no it's all these good movies things. are much deeper than that yes and so it really impressed me when when once they named that i couldn't get away from those underlying themes mm-hmm. they are hugely important and it mentioned in there that they shot it from the perspective of a child and you mm-hmm. realize do you realize that you do not see an adult male besides the kids you don't see an adult male face until about an hour and 14 minutes into it i noticed that immediately uh-huh. they wanted that faceless government yep. they wanted even the teacher you don't you see the back of his head he's walking backwards absolutely yes that very intentional well the idea for et came to steven spielberg while he was making close encounters of the third kind back in 1977 this has become our our magical year we've <laughs> said 1977 like 1977 yes. he had wanted to make a film about his parents divorce for a long time mm. and while he was making close encounters of the third kind he said that he was literally filming and they got to the scene where the the little extraterrestrial comes down from the ship and does the hand signs with Francois Truffaut. And he said, this is Stephen talking, I suddenly thought, wait a second. What if that creature never went back to the ship? What if the creature was part of a foreign exchange program? Mm. Dreyfus goes, he stays. That was the feeling I had. 
what if I turned my story about divorce into a story about a children slash family trying to fill a great need? Mm -hmm. What if Elliot needed for the first time in his life to become responsible for a life form to fill the gap in his heart? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was interesting, too, that Elliot's name begins and ends with E.T. I wonder if that was... Oh, if that was intentional. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Also, let's give a little hello to Fairhope, Alabama, where Close Encounters was filmed. I did a radio interview there recently. That's right. So hello to Fairhope. Yes. Hi, and thank you. Yes. Well, a BBC culture article talked more about this idea of Steven Spielberg and how he was inspired by his own situation with his family, the divorce in particular. And it said, E.T. is not autobiographical in the way that we might expect, but it draws prominently from Steven Spielberg's youth. They said particularly in the way that the film reconfigures Spielberg. Steven Spielberg's childhood. They said the main aspect that crosses over into the film is the divorce of his parents, but also they talk about how the absence of the father is so keenly felt in the movie, especially in the painful dinner scene that occurs early on. Yeah. And they said that that is something that Steven really felt. And then they also said that Steven, the person himself, is sort of duplicated into the two boy characters of Elliot and Michael. Mm-hmm. And this is from their their wording, which I think I think was strong. They said, being at once the lost child who yearns for friendship, which in the film's case takes the form of a bond with an alien, mm-hmm. and also the protective older sibling. Mm-hmm. Steven Spielberg had two younger sisters. Mm-hmm. So he took those things that he personally struggled mm-hmm. with, including the loneliness, because mm-hmm. he talks about that in some of his interviews. Mm-hmm. And he put them into these children mm-hmm. in this film, and he had Melissa Matheson help him to develop this. I love it. Yes. Now, following this little rabbit trail just a little bit down the road, I thought this was the most beautiful little story. I was again watching the Drew Barrymore reunion show where she had her whole family there. She had Henry Thomas, who had played Elliot. She had Robert McNaughton, who'd played her older brother, Michael. And then she had Dee Wallace, who had played her mother. Okay. And so let me share with you this little story that Dee Wallace shared with Drew Barrymore's audience. There was very much a stigma about uh, divorced families back then. And um, Stephen told me uh, at the 20th reunion, he said, you know, I think you're the first single mother on on the big screen, Mary. And uh, at one of our conventions, a young man came up to me and he, (laughs) I get all emotional. Miss Wallace, I was in middle school in a very small town in the South and my parents got divorced and all of my friends, even my best friend ditched me. And that summer ET came out and you were a single mother of a divorced family. And all of a sudden it gave everyone permission to include me again, you know, and that's, that really is the power the power that a film can have wasn't that a beautiful story That's so sad but it hit me yeah. to think that in the early 80s yeah. she might have been the first single mother you on know screen? from a divorce situation you know on the big screen yeah and the fact that people were not playing with that child it's because not the of the child's that. fault but mm-hmm. yes to say that it gave them permission to include me again oh goodness wow so that that struck me and mm-hmm. it made me think about that again i would have thought this is a movie about an alien but that issue of divorce is clearly so prevalent. And mm-hmm. once it was named for me, I could see the siblings and their interactions. Mm-hmm. I could mm-hmm. see how it weighed on the mother and just so many different pieces where it was just underlying what was mm-hmm. happening in the That dinner movie scene itself. is so, so sad. Yeah. Well, back to what we were saying, we were talking about how it came to be. And there was an Entertainment Weekly article that was titled E.T. the Extraterrestrial would never have existed without Harrison Ford's help. There you go. So here we go. While he was appearing for the opening night 40th anniversary screening of E.T. at the Turner Classic Movies Classic Film Festival, Steven Spielberg talked quite a bit. He gave a lot of information. I got to watch most, if not all of it. It was fascinating. But one of the stories 
stories he told was how Melissa Matheson came to be working on the project. Okay. So what happened was Harrison was filming Raiders of the Lost Ark. Melissa Matheson was his girlfriend at this mm-hmm. time. And Steven Spielberg had worked out most of the story in his mind, but he needed a writer. So he said, quote, I was shooting in Tunisia. We were shooting outside the Well of Souls with Harrison and Harrison's girlfriend, Melissa Matheson, was there on location. I was just talking to her and I told her my ET idea, the whole story. And she said, I've retired from writing. I don't write anymore. I'm not interested in writing anymore. It's too hard. She turned me down. Hmm. So then it goes on and he explains that he felt like she was a really good fit because he loved, she had written The Black Stallion and he thought that that was a very strong, strong piece. And so he was a little frustrated. So he shared that he went to Harrison and said, your girlfriend turned me down. (laughs) She doesn't want to write my next movie. And Harrison Ford said, let me talk to her. Wow. And so Stephen goes on to explain that after Harrison talked to her, she came to me and said, quote, you got Harrison so excited about this. What is it that I missed? And Stephen said, I think I hadn't told the story to her very well because I told the story to her again. And she got really emotional hearing the story again. And she committed right in the middle of the Tunisian desert. Interesting. So sometimes it's like that, you know, that meme where you have the story in your head and it looks so beautiful. And then you try to tell the story and it's like scribbles and like a little (laughs) half tree. So apparently he had it in his head more than he had it than he was explaining it. Right. And Mm. she also changed it. Here's how it played out. They began collaborating on the script while he was still in post-production on Raiders of the Lost Ark. Mm -hmm. And he said that she would come over and they would spend two hours a day for maybe five days at a time. And then after they would kind of get their brains, you know, lined up, she would go off and she would write several pages. Mm -hmm. And then she would come back with those pages Mm -hmm. and they would do another five days. Well, he gives her a lot of credit for making E.T. the powerful story that it turned out to be because he said she's the one through these conversations they would have with each other that she's the one who would help bring in some of the elements that ended up being central to the story Mm. like E.T. having powers Mm -hmm. or his emotional connection with Elliot where they could feel each other's things so he says quote I had given her the narrative but all the little moments like E.T.'s ability to teleport things E.T.'s ability with telekinesis and also the idea that E.T. could feel Elliot's feelings that was something that happened in the spontaneity of working with a writer that was never in the story I presented to Melissa. There were so many details of character that Melissa brought into my world mm. from her world. Interesting. I love that. I like that too. That's a good collaboration. Exactly. You mm-hmm. know, and I think that's a theme. We're going to have to do an episode just on Steven Spielberg one of these days. Oh, yeah. But clearly, this is a man who has his own genius and so much skill and ability, but he knows how to collaborate with mm-hmm. people and bring and out... Who to collaborate with right to let them bring out the best in him he helps bring out the best of that person Mm -hmm. Ah, it's just a beautiful thing well melissa went on to say in the the making of et the extraterrestrial that many of the scenes from the movie came from her own experience being around children she said for example in terms of coming up with what et's powers would be she said that a lot of children would mention the obvious you know things like telepathy or telekinetic powers but she was struck by the fact that when she would talk to different kids and ask them what magic or what type of powers they would want from a creature, a lot of them said they would like the ability to heal. And so that's where that idea came from. And she said that she thought that was, this is her, these are her words. She thought that was such an incredibly poignant idea to come from a child. That is. Yeah. Well, Melissa came back with a draft that Steven Spielberg said was probably the greatest first draft he'd ever read in his life like it was basically what ended up getting Uh filmed it was so great he went to Kathleen Kennedy who was the associate producer on Raiders of the Lost Ark and he asked her if she would want to produce E.T. and he said you need to read this script because it's probably the best script I've ever read. And she came back and said the same thing. And again, he said, it's all because of Melissa. So there's how it came to be. So before we move on to talk about casting, why don't we take a short break? Allow me to set the scene. You're sitting on a porch swing, a cup of hot tea warming your hands. The day is overcast, but there's a bit of a breeze. It's raining, a gentle rain, just enough that the birds are still chirping. There's a cat purring on your lap. You close your eyes and breathe in the moment. This quiet, 
beautiful moment, this time for yourself, is what we here at Scandal Water wish for you. Moments of serenity, moments to pause, take a breath, drink the tea, pet the cat, and feel utterly at peace. Happy listening. All right, we are back and ready to talk about the casting of Mm. E.T. So we've already talked a bit about Dee Wallace Mm -hmm. and, you know, the story she shared about being the first, we think, single mother on the big screen. But just a little bit more about her. She was, her character, Mary, was modeled after Stephen's own mother. Oh, He says in several interviews that he based the mother in the film on his own mom. In fact, here's a quote that he gave to 60 Minutes. My mom didn't parent us as much as she sort of big-sistered us. Mm. She was Peter Pan. She refused to grow up. Mm. In that same little Turner Classic movie interview that I've already mentioned, he shared just a tiny bit about his mom. I'll play this from Steven Spielberg. The reason I cast Dee, she has the heart of a child. And she would allow her kids to call her Mary, not mom. Because yeah. we called my mom, I call, I call, we all call my mom Lee. Her name was Leo. We didn't call her mom, we called her Lee. And so, uh, so in a sense, I cast the child in Dee Wallace to be part of, the, so she wasn't really the adult. Peter Coyote was the adult, okay. but Dee was part of the kid group. I noticed that in the film. I thought it was a uh, outtake, or I thought it was a mistake that got kept in because Drew Barrymore's character says something. What are you up to? She's like nothing, Mary. And I thought she just called her mm-hmm. Mary instead of Mom. Intentional, oh. intentional. And when you think about it, at one point Elliot insults his brother, and before she says Elliot, she kind of laughs at it. Uh-huh. I started noticing everything. The fact that she's kind of wearing a robe while Michael and all his buddies yeah. are hanging out. She was like one of the kids or the big sister and they pointed out in a different article that the fact that she got so excited about halloween yes she she did she wanted to be dressed up and to have her own fun as much as she wanted to enjoy the kids and i think she was she was lonely too because then Mm -hmm. they show when the kids didn't come back and she blows out the candles and whatnot but yes uh, talking about peter pan she was reading peter pan to drew's gertie oh what a nice little nod Mm -hmm. i didn't even pay attention to that well One last little fun fact. Dee Wallace was very disappointed, she shared, when the rest of the cast from E.T. got to attend the royal screening and they got to meet Princess Diana. Huge deal. Yeah. Yes. But the reason Dee Wallace had to miss was because right after filming E.T., she was busy filming the soon-to-be blockbuster Cujo. Oh, yeah. wow. What a yeah. what a life. Ooh. So she, she had a good little run there. She did. Yeah. Well, moving on to Henry Thomas as Elliot. He was only nine years old when he auditioned. He still had the little kid voice. Adorable. The little squeaky voice. Adorable. Yes. Of course, he was 10 when he played the role, but he was already experienced. E.T. was his third film. Oh. And in fact, his name had been suggested to Steven Spielberg by some other friend in the business. Now, Steven shared that when Henry Thomas came in to the audition, he was not blowing it away. I mean, uh-huh. like he, he was a little introverted. They, he, Steven said he was struggling with the line readings, not because of reading them, just with the emotion, with the, emotion. With the appropriate expression. Mm-hmm. It wasn't realistic enough for him. So Steven got the idea to just switch gears totally. He said, okay, we're going to improvise. He sets it up. You've got this best friend that's a creature, and this guy has shown up, this NASA rep, is at your door, and he's telling you that he's going to take away this creature that's Mm -hmm. your best friend, Mm -hmm. and he had Henry improvise. I'm going to let you hear just a little piece of that. Is this at the end where he goes, okay, kid, you got the part? Yes, (laughs) yes. Let's hear just a little bit of that. an alien somewhere in this house. Is that true? Is it true? Is there an alien in this house? Yes, sir. Well, as you know, I am from the government. I'm part of the United States government, and I am empowered to take that alien with me. But you can't take him away. He's mine. Well, but the government is bigger than you are, Elliot. And I, I really, I have all the authority to take him, and i got to tell you, I'm going to take him. You can't take him. Well, I'm afraid I have to, son. You can't take him away. But it's not my choice. The president asked me to come here and get it. I don't care what the president says. He's my best friend. And he can't take you away. Well, it's, it's 
real possible, Elliot, that, that he'll come back and you can have him again. So I don't know if you could hear that, but he's crying. Yes, he, he is. is. His little face crumpled. Full on, realistic, yes. brought to tears yes. as he's arguing with this pretend government, government official. official. Yes. And as actually. Who's not giving him very much to work with, may I say? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, well, I'm sorry, son. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Nope. I'm going to take him. Yes. Well, as Ashley said, it ends with Steven Spielberg saying, you've got the part. He told him yeah. right there in yeah. the audition. Yes, he did. That he got it. And Henry Thomas talked about this in a 2022 interview with Good Morning America. He shared that meeting Steven Spielberg during his audition was huge for him because he was the biggest fan of Raiders of the Lost Aww. Ark. He wanted to be Indiana Jones. Aww. That was his goal as a 10-year-old. So he said that the audition experience was really pretty nerve-wracking for yeah. him, yeah. but that hearing Stephen tell him he got the job before he even left was amazing. He said, quote, so I knew that I had it, which was a very unique and wonderful feeling. That is. Well, moving on to Robert McNaughton, who starred as Elliot's big brother, Michael. He told Yahoo Movies back in 2017 that he had actually been flown out to LA to try out for a different movie, which he did not get. Mm -hmm. But while he was there, a casting director made the call to the guy who was casting E.T. And according to Robert, he said, quote, my first audition was just a meeting with Stephen, and it was on the day that President Reagan was shot. Oh. But one of the things he asked me was, what do you like to do? I said, well, I ride bikes a lot. He goes, yeah, that's in the movie. Mm. And I said, I play Dungeons and Dragons. And he goes, that's in the movie too. So I was just, I said all the right things, I guess. <laughs> and so he, of course, got the part. Yeah. Stephen said that he knew right away when he saw the audition of Robert that, that he was going to get that part. Yeah. But Robert talked about the fact that he had a really good bond with Henry Thomas. And he said that he and Henry would play Dungeons and Dragons on set. And he remembered one time Stephen asked to join them. Oh, you know something? This is just random. but something thinking of that character that I really like back in those old movies. Well, old is relative. But I love that they had realistic teeth. You mm -hmm. know how now everybody's teeth is very white and veneered and it doesn't look like you could have those kind of teeth like he had kid teeth and i just like that this is the second time you've mentioned teeth in this i know episode. i know i have a thing about teeth you we you notice tiny teeth, teeth i do you notice you do not like tiny no teeth. tiny teeth for me no. but like realistic teeth i can get behind that okay no fake teeth no fake no tiny no tiny give us some real teeth <laughs> give us some real teeth <laughs> and yes. you've got ashley's approval you do like, okay that's well. a solid movie right there <laughs> <laughs> oh that's funny all right, Drew Barrymore. She played Gertie. She was only five when she auditioned, oh. six when she played the role. And Steven Spielberg shared in that same Turner Classic Movie interview that he interviewed a lot of kids for mm -hmm. all of the lead children roles. But he said Drew literally stormed into his office and took over the meeting. She told him that she was not an actor. She had a punk rock band mm. and she was given all the details. And he was listening to her. He's sharing how he soon figured out this band was imaginary but she was so believable and mm -hmm. it was like she believed it and she was making him believe it and he decided that she would be perfect for the role because with an imagination like, like that. that she could she could <laughs> believe that an extraterrestrial was real and, and she did she says that later that she thought it was real but mm -hmm. one of the lines and i know we're not talking about the film full on but while i'm thinking of it when she says I did the breakfast. She says, she goes, but I did the breakfast dishes or whatever it was. Oh, it was, uh, I was just like, oh, I would do anything for this little girl. I would do anything. Adorable. Yeah. Adorable. Well, she told the Wall Street Journal not that long ago in an interview that the most prized item she keeps in her dressing room is a photo of herself with Steven Spielberg mm -hmm. on that set. Mm -hmm. And this was a quote that she gave them. Not having a dad, not having that kind of relationship with anyone, he was just so good and nurturing and kind. We still have a really wonderful relationship. I thank him because had he not chosen me, I think my life would be really different. It's crazy when you can really trace it back to someone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she looked exactly like Drew Barrymore, just tiny. You know, she mm -hmm. even had the little crooked mouth and everything. <laughs> she did. She yeah. did. This struck me just because I taught the outsiders for several years at school and we always watched the movie. C. Thomas Howell, who goes on to play ah. Ponyboy in The Outsiders, was in this movie. He played Tyler and he was 13 years old at the time. Goes on to star in other things as well, including The Walking Dead and, and Gettysburg. But I thought that was interesting. Yes. This is probably where he got his start. Yes. 
And Peter Coyote was the faceless man for much of the movie. You mm-hmm. do get to see him there, you know, in the latter half. He's the one that had the keys. Keys. They so call his, him Keys. Yeah, his name is Keys. And this was basically his first really big mainstream role, although he went on after that to perform in many things and became much more well known. But a fun fact is that I thought you would enjoy this. He does a lot of voice work, including mm. a huge number of the Ken Burns documentaries. <gasps> I do love that. Yes. Nice. I thought you would. I do. Yeah. We are going to talk a lot about E.T. in the next episode. But since we're talking about casting and, and some of the human involvement, mm-hmm. I'll go ahead and speak briefly to E.T.'s voice. Stephen needed someone to voice it. So he asked his good friend, Deborah Winger, mm-hmm. to record. Did you know this? I did. You wanna... Only that she had done. I, I saw later that she was one of the voices, but I thought she was the only voice, but she was one of. Yeah. So Stephen said in the interview that in the first rough cuts of the film, when they were you know piecing it together, you actually would have heard Deborah Winger as E.T. Mm. <laughs> So as we move towards closing this first half, because this is a Mm two-parter, so much of the talk in this particular half of the episode has been around the idea of children Mm -hmm. and the the sibling dynamics and the family dynamics. And one of the things that I'm going to piggyback on that is the kids were so important to this film that he did realize he, Stephen decided he was going to tell the story from the perspective of children, in particular, the child Elliot. And he also did a few things differently because of this choice. So for example, he shared that he decided to shoot his movie in a very different way Mm -hmm. because of the children. He said, instead of doing the way you would normally do, where you would just kind of jump around and you would do what was convenient or depending on different factors like weather or location or whatever. Yeah. He decided he needed to shoot the entire movie in continuity, starting at the beginning of the script and working through from start to finish over the course of the shoot. And this was a creative choice designed to help his child actors. To bond. Well, and also he said, quote, I wanted the kids to know that what we're shooting now today is happening today. And the next three pages of the script will happen tomorrow. What we just shot happened yesterday. I wanted them to actually live a life, a Mm. life of the story at the end of the movie there's a lot of emotions and they were there for every take because they were saying goodbye for real because they knew soon they'd be going home they felt the story that's really smart right but it's also really expensive that was such a commitment yes i was so impressed and i i don't remember ever hearing that before Mm -mm, i don't remember that that was really cool i thought one thing i thought one thing that did strike me is how believable they were as siblings and that makes sense Mm -hmm. to be so young yes yes and another thing that came out this was again on the drew barrymore show she's the one i think who actually said that Stephen knew how to get the best out of the children he knew how to all of them actually spoke to this they would talk about how he would give very specific feedback very specific direction to them robert mcnaughton said he would give examples that were relatable to mm-hmm, them mm-hmm. to try to get them to understand what he was wanting or, or trying how to get kid, them to do how mm-hmm. the kids were feeling Yes, and this was one last little clip that I'm going to play for you where we hear a little about how Stephen was very intentional about how he tried to work with these children. Robert, the first time you saw E.T., was that surreal? You Did you get a glimpse of him like when you weren't supposed to? Like, did you accidentally find him? How, what, how, no. What is the rumor there? It, well, I think they, on purpose, I think Stephen wanted me to see him, the actual working model, for the first time when I actually see him in the film. The scenes on the bike were filmed first, so the only thing I saw was sort of this fake-looking dummy in a in a basket. Right. All wrapped up in thing, and my heart sank. I thought, you know, this is the act, this is what's going to be ET. You know, oh. just, it looked so fake. It was like rubbery, and it looked, they wrapped it up in a blanket so it wouldn't be obvious. But still, we had to do stunts and stuff. So when I saw it, it was a scene which is brilliantly choreographed with you screaming, E.T. running through with his arms up, and, you know, and me backing up and the shelves falling down, which they didn't tell me was going to happen. The shelves were a complete surprise. (laughs) Steven had the prop guys on the other side of the shelves pull the pins. So that that was, that got part of the reaction, you know. Now, I believed E.T. was real. (laughs) Totally. Oh, yeah. I really 
really loved him in such a profound way. Is it like true that what what would happen? Because I would go and take lunch to him. Well, but yeah. Well, I don't... well, you would. The thing I remember, the first thing I remember is that this, we were on stage and it was quite cold in the stage, on the stage. And uh, you asked the wardrobe lady if you could have a scarf for E.T.'s neck. Oh. He was getting it cold. So you wrapped the scarf around his neck. But Dee has a great story because... Well you would go, we found you over there just talking away to E.T. <laughs> and so we let Stephen know. And so Stephen, from that time on, appointed two guys to keep E.T. alive. So whenever you came over to talk to him, he could react to you. So to think about that commitment yeah. that this director assigned two, two guys. guys so that E.T. would, it would be not able to respond to her. Curve. Yes, mm -hmm. and she believed him to be real through that entire shoot. Which makes the goodbye mean a lot more because she thought she was really saying goodbye to E.T. Yes, yes, those stories. I liked even Robert's story when he talked about Stephen intentionally not letting him see E.T. Yeah. E. as the real, as the working figure and then having the, sh the surprise of the shelves dropping to get the realistic like, reaction so smart it is so smart well a sweet little side note Stephen shared that he had never planned to have kids until et oh and i watched him i saw so many of the behind the scenes film clips and so many pictures and things the way he interacted with those children mm -hmm. was beautiful oh. and i i have to believe that he felt an extra connection because it was so it was sort of about his life it, too. yes i feel like it it was so personal to him yeah. But he was wonderful with them, and he said that he felt very much like a dad through mm -hmm. that entire filming process. He felt very protective of the children, and it changed his perspective. And he now has many children and grandchildren, Aww. and he goes back to E.T. And says thanks to E.T. Yeah. Well, I think we're ready for our armchair, Ashley. All right. Armchair Psychologist. All right, Ashley. So we've talked about several things. Um, most of it's centered around the children and the children perspective and some of the dynamics of, of Stephen's family and how that played out in this movie. What are your thoughts? You know, what what is this making you think about as you listen to these ideas and you're remembering your rewatch of mm -hmm. the movie? I think it was a very smart idea to do this film from the perspective of a child to show almost everything at the child level and to put it in that childlike wonder because because I would say a majority of the audience would be that age group. So they were seeing themselves on screen and putting themselves in that position. And I think that's possibly why it became such a beloved film is they were able to relate to it. I mean, we've talked about Stranger Things, and this is one of the seminal films that oh, influenced yes. Stranger Things. And I could see that over and over yes. again. I would I would go like, there's Stranger Things. Oh, that's where they got right that. Right there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's also interesting that we've talked about throughout this podcast about how George and Stephen were inspired in their childhood. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing Stephen and George are inspiring the next generation of filmmakers like J.J. Abrams, who took over and he actually actually was inspired by Steven and wanted to be a filmmaker because of Steven. Mm -hmm. So it's this fascinating train that we've now lived long enough to see other people get inspired. Yeah. There was the scene, Elliot goes out, and I think it's when he first sees E.T. out in the back shed or whatever uh -huh. that thing is. And the cornfield was over there to the side. I would not have gone in that cornfield. Well, I was thinking, is this where M. Night Shyamalan oh, gets the idea for Signs? signs because very it looked very reminiscent mm -hmm. of some of the scenes from Signs. Mm -hmm. And I that was an immediate thought. The child perspective aspect hit me so much it, because of the wonder, because of the fantasy and the magic and all of those elements, but also because of the suspense. Mm -hmm. Because they put you in, whether you were a child or whether you were an adult, they made you relate to Elliot mm -hmm. and they kept showing things. They made things more suspenseful because you would see, like, they used light and shadow a lot. Yes, they light really and shadow. Did. And there was a lot of suspense that was built through what was in the dark versus what was being shown, what mm -hmm. was being spotlighted. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of suspense. Again, it wasn't, I don't think it was conscious, I guess is the word. But when you look back at it analytically and you started noticing, oh my goodness, all of the bad guys are always faceless. Yeah. That makes it more suspenseful. That gives them that element of uncertainty mm -hmm. or the unknown. And what a fake out to have Peter Coyote be this, this faceless guy in the keys and you think he's going to be a bad guy. And then, oh no, he he's not. He's not really. 
But you know what? You know what caused him to suddenly become more human? What? If I analyze this correctly, somebody will check me on this. But I think in the movie, when we first start to see him as an empathetic person versus a faceless government guy, was when he would they had tapped the kid's house and he overheard the brothers of the family talking oh. about sad things oh. and their family situation. Okay. And the dad, and all of a sudden, it was it like... Changed it. it? And it almost made me think, was the subtle message the power of a child Maybe. to impact adults? Maybe. To That's impact a- the feelings of this man that's a good insight thank you yeah very nice <laughs> very nice analytic somebody's gonna watch it and come back and be like, like that's nah, totally wrong. She was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but but it did hit me it hit me enough that i made a little note of it well maybe that's a good place to go ahead and end okay part one all right let's give a big old cheers to our thread yes melissa matheson yes what a beautiful script what and a- i'm really glad that it was a female script writer that's really neat yeah. you know it's very rare cheers to you melissa cheers If you love what we do, please rate and review our show. Or you can become a supporter by making a donation through buymeacoffee.com slash scandalwaterpod. Whether a single gift or a recurring monthly donation, it would go a long way towards supporting our work and allowing us to keep the tea brewing. At our website, www.scandalwaterpodcast.com, you can submit questions or your own story ideas, access our sources and show notes, see the merch we offer for sale, and more. You can Join the Scandal Water community through our Scandal Water Podcast Facebook page or follow us on Instagram or TikTok at Scandal Water Podcast. This episode was executive produced by Candy Thomas, that's me, and Ashley Raymer Brown, that's me. It was researched and written by Candy Thomas and edited by Ashley Raymer Brown. A special thank you to Josh Martin, who wrote, composed, and performed the Scandal Water theme and other music, Matt C. Adams, who created the artwork, and Joshua Reith, who designed our website and provides ongoing technical support. As a reminder, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes. The thoughts and opinions of the host during each episode of Scandal Water are their own and do not reflect the opinions of any future guests, advertisers, or clearly professional psychologists. Thanks for listening.